Thanks everybody, hello, um, Merry Christmas, good to see everyone. Um, I, uh, it's funny looking at this Christmas, it's a bit different to our last Christmas which was actually in Canada, which you can tell by my wife's ice hockey shirt, but that was us uh, 12 months ago roughly, uh, we went to Canada, Dad said he'd let me know if I need to up the microphone, so I took that as a sign, but actually... I was going to turn the lights off, but then it wouldn't be... Okay, we'll leave the lights off. We don't need to see me really, but... Um, yeah, so, so we went to Canada, um, and it's very, very different to here. And so that's what I've been thinking about this year. As Dad said, we went to Akaroa. Uh, we couldn't get the kids to sleep until 9 o'clock at night because it was so bright in, in New Zealand, whereas in Canada, uh, it's dark by about 4.30 at night, and it's, uh, it's cold. So I wanted to share something with you guys, mainly just because I think it's interesting, and because my son is very cute. Uh, it, was, it was Jasper, uh, at three months old, and of course you have to rug him up. Um, and that was him in his little capsule, and we ended up taking the capsule out and putting it in a sled. Um, so this is how Canadians do Christmas. It's a frozen over pond, and you can build uh, a bonfire right there on the pond, uh, which we did, and, and skate around the pond, and so we were pulling Jasper uh, on a sled behind that. Um, and I want to introduce you to uh, Brenda's auntie, Rose. Uh, Rose is an incredible lady. She's 80-something, and she really knows how to do Christmas. This is her Christmas tree. So it's 80 years, or 80 plus years worth of Rose collecting things, and so she took us through, and there is a reason for every one of those ornaments on that Christmas tree, and they're all incredibly ornate, um, but she had, well, there's a lot of little um, animals, and some have got wings and some don't, and the ones that have wings and turn out they've flown off, they've, they've passed away, so she, every pet she's ever had is a dog or a cat with wings or without up there, and they all hang on a tree, and it's pretty hard to see, but the Santa Claus is she must have probably 15 in her house, and and uh, so there's one to the left of the tree, I don't even see it. It doesn't quite look like Santa Claus because we used to them being red, but this one is a fur-covered Santa Claus, um, and, and there's lots of those in Christmas fairies. And so that, uh, that's how Canadians do Christmas. So I'm going to talk about why in a minute, but this is one day when I was there, I took a screenshot because I was pretty impressed with myself. I went ice fishing uh, <laughs> in 31 degrees, uh, minus 31. Uh, further down, you can see it says with wind chill uh, minus 37. So it definitely felt like minus 37 out there. Um, and I grew up. Did anybody go? I was thinking this. I don't have any classmates. I don't think. But did anybody have Mrs. Williamson for a teacher? Standard four. It's a few. Yeah. So Mrs. Williamson was awesome because she used to take us on lots of field trips. I remember as a nine-year-old. Um, and one of them was to the Antarctic Centre. We spent a lot of time learning about Antarctica. And so when I was there, some of that information from five years ago started coming back to me um, and so I wondered what's the difference in temperature between Antarctica and Greenfell where we were in Canada and actually we were colder than Antarctica so everything I've been taught about Antarctica like they told us that you can uh, you can throw water in the hot water in the air in Antarctica and it's frozen by the time it hits the ground so I thought I'd try that and other things I'd always wanted to go to Antarctica and try so I'm not sure how this is going to work because I've bluetoothed it you probably won't be able to hear it um, but this is me doing the water trick, and thankfully it worked, and I didn't get boiling water on my head, but it's... Yeah, you can't hear it. So I mean, I'm talking to the fact that it's minus 23, I took the screenshot on this day, and you can see the jug is hitting 98, I can let it get to 100, you can see it's boiling, so this isn't a trick, there's water coming out the spout. It's taking its time. convinced that the jug boiled, so here's me with 100 degree water walking outside of my brother-in-law's house in Greenfell. If you've, if you've got me on Facebook, you've probably seen this, but it's worth watching again, I think. Okay, here we go. This is what happens to boiling water. And this is Brenda saying that this is why she's so tough. <laughs> So that's what it's like in Canada, and we genuinely felt tough. It's amazing because it's so cold that that's what happens to water. So you don't actually get that cold because your feet don't get wet when you're walking around outside um, because it's, it's too dry. It's so cold that it's dry. And so if we had the volume, you could hear me walking out there, it goes crunch, 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 and, and um, cars going down the road go crunch along the road. They don't slide on ice because it's too cold for there to be ice. The snow stays snow even when you dry up over the top of it. And so it's interesting there, it gets to minus five and all the Canadians start going, oh, oh, it's getting cold here. 
and, uh, that's for Brenda. Um, and, but yeah, it's getting, it's getting too warm actually is what they think because when it gets, starts to get to there you start getting too much, too much spice and then you're in trouble and that's when they start having accidents on the road. So, so that was my trip to Canada. I thought it was tough, um, but then this is, I will apologise, I don't usually do this when I'm speaking, I will apologise, I put these slides together thinking I was going to talk about this guy, and then I changed my mind, but then Dad and Ian changed my mind again today, so I do want to talk about uh, Ernest Shackleton, anybody heard of Shackleton? A few Shackleton fans, so forgive me if I get this wrong, but this is, uh, he's an interesting cat, so I thought I'd share this, because he was part of um, Scott's crew that went to Antarctica, he was on a ship, and Scott, of course, Robert Scott, didn't make it. Yeah, there was the trip where they tried to get to the South Pole. I think he made it, but didn't make it back. Um, and so Shackleton thought that he would save his country's honour, and he, he did what they called the Imperial Transatlantic uh, Journey, or something. He named it something quite quite polluting like that. And his whole plan was to get to Antarctica and walk from one side to the other. So he got a crew of 28 men. Those that are quick counters, I know there's only 27, I think, in that photograph, but there was one guy stowed away when they got to Buenos Aires. <laughs> so some clown got on the ship and stowed away, and they didn't find out until uh, a few months later when it was too late to turn around. Um, and it was a few uh, weeks after that that they ended up getting stuck. So the name of the ship is Endurance. The reason I'm talking about this is I just read, th read this phenomenal book called Endurance. So it's all about this. And it is well worth a read, because these guys are tough. Like, way tougher than throwing boiling water in the air. Um, they got stuck on, on the ship that became launched uh, in, in January and it finally smashed up in October. So when the crew's on the ship, it got completely icebound and they just got stuck there. And they had to spend that what, nine months uh, living on the ship, listening to the creaks and groans and thinking, you know, she's a well-built ship, um, which it really was. It's amazing to put up with that much. But then when, this, when the ice started to break up, when it started getting warmer again, um, then it just got crushed because the flow started moving around. So they pinned all their hopes on being able to get out of there. Instead, they just watched the thing um, go down. And so they thought, we've got to get out of here. Um, and they went out and they made a couple of camps. They kept sort of shifting from flow to flow um, because the interesting thing about these ice flows, some of them were miles wide and you could camp in the middle of it and it's fine, but some that aren't so wide would get rocky. Um, and uh, so they, they lived on those for, for five months. They spent um, living on these ice flows. So well over a year, they were living in the middle of the Windle Sea in Antarctica. Um, they took their lifeboats and, and tried to make them a bit more seaworthy and put in some masts. They, they had a, um, a carpenter with them. Uh, and so they built these life rafts, but they couldn't move them off the ice flow they were on because it was just, there was too much, um, there was too much ice in them, there were too many crevices, it was just impassable, so that's why they had to live on the ice, but finally when the ice started breaking up, they, they had to go for it. And so they took their three lifeboats and went for it. And again, I sort of put these together and thought I wasn't going to, so I wish I had more pictures, but it's quite incredible what these guys did. They, they dragged these lifeboats for miles to the edge of the ice flow and then dropped them in the water. And then they, had, they tried to get out and they knew that there were some islands um, a couple of days away essentially. And so they got in their boats and tried to get out, but when they got past the pack of ice, uh, it was way too windy. So they came back, and they came back behind this wall of ice um, and realised that they couldn't just park up next to an iceberg and sleep because if you did that, you'd probably just get smashed against the iceberg. And then, so what they decided to do was sleep on top of an iceberg, but the iceberg started breaking up um, during the night. And of course, we all know 90% of the iceberg is, is underwater, but when it's in pack ice like that, if it starts coming off, the danger is if it erodes underneath, it becomes top heavy. And so in the middle of the night, they could all just, they all just invert and they'd all be drowned um, in a most horrible way. So, so they did spend one night on, the, um, on an ice float, but they ended up having to jump back in the water. And so these guys, after more than a year on the ice, haven't changed clothes, haven't had a shower, um, haven't done anything. Because some of the stuff they went through, they actually arrived with um, packs of dogs um, because they were going to take these huskies across um, the Antarctic. And so these guys got really attached to these dogs and they had nothing to read, but they had stuff to write. So they, they spent, and you see, got these really tough guys talking about like, the horrors of having to put their dogs down when they started running out of food. Um, because as the night got darker, so in, in Antarctica in the middle of winter, they didn't see daylight for months. Um, and as that happens, you don't get penguins showing up or seals showing up, and so they completely ran out of food. And so here they are, knowing they've got to move. Um, they managed to get into the water, and they started cruising to Elephant Island. Um, they, they spent five days at sea, and they eventually got there. But this sea 
it's really hard to comprehend. Like we were just in Akaroa and we went, well, I didn't even go out because um, I'm the worst and the sea was like a metre high. Um, but Brenda went out, my wife, um, and Kyle went diving, and it, but it's, it's rough and you're barreling through trying to sort of it. And, and um, Muttnar as well, you know, it's not a fun sea when it's like a metre high, but these guys went out in, a, in one of the most dangerous seas in the world trying to hit an island and they knew where islands were but they knew that they had to sail and they had oars and so one day they saw the they could see the sun and their navigator who was a kiwi guy um, from which turned out from makaroa frank Wors worsley knew where they were and said okay we've got to head this way to an island and so they started rowing they had the sails up and they went for it to try and get to that island and they thought they'd made about 30 miles uh, and then the next day the sun came up again and he checked their spot and they'd actually gone 50 miles in the opposite direction because even though the wind was blowing them one way and they were rowing one way they didn't realize the current was dragging them the other way and so at that point they changed where they were going and they changed their mind four times before they landed on okay we're going to go to elephant island and they knew when they got there that we have to land if we miss the island the current's too much and we'll be sucked out and we'll be gone and so they, they knew that they had to get there and it's a miracle that this Worsley just seems to be an unbelievable navigator managed to land them on Elephant Island. And so, you know, the story continues. They got to Elephant Island, which is still too remote. They knew that nobody had ever been there before and probably ever would. Um, so they, um, so Shackleton decided from there to take five guys. One of them was Worsley, the Kiwi guy. Another one was Tom Crean, this, um, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? off the coast of Britain, Ireland. He's an Irish guy. <laughs> <laughs> really tough fella. I wish I had pictures of these guys because they, they're just unbelievable what they had to endure. Uh, but they, they got in the boat and they decided that they needed to do a 720 mile journey um, to the South Georgia Islands where they knew that there was whaling stations. And they knew if they stayed where they were because Elephant Island is just, it's just basically a mountain in the sea. So there's hardly anywhere for them to stay. They did find, you can see on this spot, that's where the mountain starts. So they found this one point out, um, which is basically on the water, barely above the high tide line, and they, they turned one of the lifeboats over and they lived in it. And then these other six guys, including Shackleton, got back in the six metre boat and it headed out for 720 miles. And if we go that direction, we're going to hit um, South Georgia, and so the South Georgia Islands. And so they just started going and they had no idea really where they're going for a lot of that. I don't know if any of you have ever, but like I found this in Mutt, now you go out and it starts to be like, well, where's land? Because you can go disorientated so quick. But these guys got in this sea with, I mean, Darwin described the seas down there, the strait that they're going through as being 200 feet high. I'm not sure if I believe that, but that, that is, I mean, you're talking 70 meter swells um, that these guys um, go through in this basically a dinghy. And they're, and they're heading towards what they think is where South Georgia sees are, and they took 15 days um, to get there and they saw the sun three times in that, in that 15 days, three times at once. And if they see the sun and they know what time of the day it is, then they know where they're heading. And that's all that they had to go off for navigation point. They didn't have a GPS or anything, they just carrying through. And they knew if they missed South Georgia, Shackleton, when he left Elephant Island, took enough food for four weeks because they knew if they didn't get to that island within four weeks, then they'd missed it and they were in the middle of the Atlantic and the next land that they could possibly hope to hit because the current is Greenland. So, like the top of the world, they're going from the bottom. And so he knew, you know, it would take four weeks because if we miss this island, we're not going to get there. And so away they went. And after 15 days, uh, they saw the land and they were about six miles from where they thought they were going to be. Just, I don't know if you can imagine covering it, just ridiculous. And one of these, and I was just reading then because I wanted to know exactly how many days I wanted to cover people with the right information, so I looked it up and it turns out when they got there, the winds were so bad, it was hurricane force winds, that they had to hang out in the boat for another couple of days before they could even get to land. And they later found out um, that a 50 ton steamer had been wrecked in that sea, in that storm. And so these guys in their dinghy survived this, hit the land, they're on the wrong side of the island, but they couldn't go to the right side of the island because they would have been sucked out into the Atlantic, and so they decided to cross. And so Cran, Worsley, and Shackleton then took nails out of the boat and, and took their one axe that they had, a little tomahawk, and they pushed the nails through their shoes so they acted like cravats, and then they climbed these sheer mountains, which only one team has done since, and that was just to see if they could do it, and they said that those guys were nuts. They did it with proper mountain gear and everything. And these guys crossed that island in 36 hours. And reading their diaries is unbelievable. They got to the top, they left at 3 a.m. and they got to the top of where they needed, to, at the top of the mountain um, at 
noon or something and they started working their way down and after and two hours they'd gone a mile and they needed to go another 20 and Shackleton said if we stay here we'll die we need to jump and the others thought that he was just laughing and so they laughed with him and he said no we need to we need to jump and they did they just held onto their britches and just jumped and skated and all laughed because they survived I can't imagine what kind of relief that would be they got there headed the wrong direction came back and eventually found the whaling ship they then borrowed uh, two boats that got wrecked going back to Elfin Island. They couldn't make it to pick up their mates for two trips and on the third one. So just to show what kind of seas these guys went through, got there and picked up their friends and not a single guy died. So that's the story of Shackleton. Again, I wish I had more photos, but, but just an unbelievable one. And it all comes down to, for me, it's that Frank Worsley was just, what an amazing navigator about a sea. You get a glimpse of the sun go, I think it was there, and then to, to put them like they did. So. So that's what real tough looks like. Let's go back to Canada and to Rose's uh, place, <laughs> which is what I was going to actually talk about, which is it's funny in Canada because you always hear, um, like every year Christmas comes up and you know, Christmas isn't even this time of the year, why do we have it now? When I went to Canada, I really understood uh, why we do Christmas when we do, because it's so dark and miserable that everybody lights up their house. Uh, with Christmas trees and, and with, um, you know, you bring fruit and stuff inside and you make it, and everybody has lights, and so we do Christmas lights here as well, but you got to wait till well, 11 o'clock at night so it's dark enough to be able to see them, whereas over there they're on most of the day because it's just always dark, and so it becomes a really joyful time of the year. So the reason that the Canadians do Christmas the way they do is to brighten up what would otherwise be a miserable time of the year, and it's actually a really great picture, I think, of. Uh, like if you're going to have Christmas at any time, why wouldn't you put it, you know, if we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus, you would put it at the place where you need to remind it that this winter isn't going to last forever. There's going to be a great day coming, and we, we can all celebrate on that day until then it gets darker and darker. And that's why Christmas is on the 25th of December, because the 22nd or 21st is the shortest day over there. So the days get shorter and shorter and shorter, then you have Christmas and the days start getting lighter. And so it's quite fun to be in Canada. It was, like, it was awesome to be here with family and wouldn't have it any other way. But it was an experience to have a white Christmas. You get why it's so special to them and why they start making fun of the fact that it's going to be a white Christmas. Now we'll get into some serious stuff. Like, I do want to say that I think the reason it's a picture of uh, and why it's a cool picture is that we're focusing on Jesus in a cool uh, time um, and we want to get there. But all around the world right now, um, I would say that the days are getting darker um, with, with some of the stuff that's passing and you can just have to look at, you know, we just passed a, a euthanasia law and when you look at what some of the countries are doing around euthanasia, it's, it's quite scary. So, like, and it, and it boggles the brain. Like, why in New Zealand would we be having a big drive to reduce suicide? Which suicide is a scourge and it's evil and, and it's terrible and so we all can agree on that. But then in the Netherlands, um, a young girl, she's 21, just got euthanized because she had an incurable depression. And so what's the difference between that and straight suicide, you know? And there's things that we can do to help these people, but we're legitimizing, we're legitimizing suicide and we passed that in New Zealand. It's a really sad day um, that that happened. Uh, abortion laws are another one. I was, I was really struck, um, you know, like on the face of it, surely everybody can agree. And biologically, we know if you take a baby out of a womb, you are killing a person. We know that that's a person. Um, but when I was watching One News, um, Andrew Little, uh, who was, oh, was, he? He was two IC of labor at the time, um, was saying um, how, how disgusting the, disgusting the um, extremists are that were, that were petitioning abortion and the beehive. So you're now an extremist is the point if you're against abortion, taking any position. And One News agreed they said we don't want to show pictures of these guys because their pictures are so extreme and it's pictures of just babies and wombs but that's an extreme position to hold now and that's what's happening around the globe. Uh, in America, you know, Trump um, being a Republican held back a lot of these abortion laws and repealed them and now America, a lot of them are celebrating because they've got Democrat back in. They're going to start throwing money back at um, Planned Parenthood of these organizations and there's Democrats now that got on the stage and, and uh, when they're running for in their primary and said there should be no limits on abortion. So otherwise there should be abortion up until birth. And we, we were looking on Facebook the other day, somebody was doing a walk around New Zealand with a cross and talking to people and there was a lady that said that you know the, the difference is sentience. So babies aren't sentient, therefore they're not actually humans. 
therefore you should be able to abort a baby until they're three or six months old because essentially they don't have sentience. So if we think it's going to stop where it was or if we think we can put rules around it or go just in these cases, that's not how it works. People always want more and darkness is getting darker. If we can't call it darkness, I don't know what we can. Drug laws are an interesting one. We voted against drug laws and then the government turns around and legalises um, testing of drugs. So we've essentially legalised drugs, whether we voted against it or not, because the whole idea is people should be able to do what they want and let's not look at Christian ethics or these old world ethics, let's just look in. So we've got people doing uh, drugs, again, whether, whether we like it or not, the government's essentially sanctioned it now. I want to talk about LGBTQIA, if you don't know what that is, it's lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, intersex, asex, and plus, because there's also more now, which is, I don't know, but anyway, it's become quite a big group. And and I'm actually, I'm for, you know, if, if people want to do what they do, let's, um, you know, leave them alone if it doesn't affect us. And that's essentially was their position for years was you know what we do in our bedrooms isn't any of your business and that's what they've said so it's okay like obviously let's focus on our hearts and that's what i preached on last time we need to focus on on our hearts and you know, you know what they do that's fine um, but it's gone far beyond that and that's where it's starting to get scary so for instance i was reading in, in reuters last night um, that norway has passed a law where it is illegal to say anything derogatory about a trans person and that comes with a one year term in prison uh, if you say it privately or three years if you say it publicly. So a sermon like this would give me three years in prison in Norway and if I said it in my own bedroom to my own wife and somebody heard about it then there would be a year. And so we've gone, the point of this isn't against trans because each person is individuals that are in their situation, and I'm not talking about that. What I am talking about is the fact that we moved really, really quickly from what they do as their business to what you say in your own bedroom about me will get you a year in prison if we want to put you there. And it's moving that way really quick. It's, it's interesting that Barack Obama ran twice. In 2008 and 2012, he ran for president on a platform of I will not legalize same-sex marriage. And then Donald Trump comes along and says he doesn't care, but the mood has shifted so quickly that they're calling Donald Trump the most anti-LGBTQ person, uh, uh, president that they've ever had. And that's how quickly the mood shifted. In 2008, the gay publication in um, England was saying that they were anti-gay marriage. They said, what's the point? Marriage is um, it's a thing for Christians and for little families. Gay people were different. And that was their position. But the, the gay advocacy magazine in 2008 said we're against it. Nowadays, if um, if we if you spoke out about it on Facebook or, or Twitter, there's a good chance people would go after your jobs, and that's what's happening. Just look at, I don't know if you've kept up with what's happening to J.K. Rowling, she wrote a bunch of books that I haven't read um, about Harry Potter, but she said something about how women are women and men should be able to be women and compete in men's sports, and that started people burning piles of her books and calling her a Nazi. So it's really interesting to me that people burning books are uh, calling other people Nazis, but anyway, so yeah, I wanted to touch on that. It's a, it's a really interesting situation, how quick the mood's shifting. The other one is the sexual revolution. I've got flat back, it's all sort of started in the 60s. It's interesting though, I was reading um, Dostoevsky, who was a writer in the 1800s, and he talked about a sexual revolution in the 1860s, and so it seems like every 100 years or so this comes up. But it's just a very, very strange situation that they find themselves in where there's no coherence anymore and they even know it. Where on the one hand they want to say that sex is purely transactional and you can have it with whoever you want and it doesn't matter, it's completely meaningless. And then on the other hand, people like Harvey Weinstein Steen should go to prison for demanding it so that people can get into movies who want to transact it. Now I'm very against this kind of sex. I'm very for um, marriage and uh, when um, being married to my wife, obviously, and so, but it's Again, observing the mood is incredible. How can they hold two positions at once? Um, and and they'll throw people like Amy Coney Barrett under the bus for being too Christian. So she's been put on the um, Supreme Court in America. She's a Catholic. She's got seven kids, and so she, but she's anti-abortion. So therefore, she's evil um, and shouldn't be. Has no place on the Supreme Court because she's married, married to a man, and has seven kids. Um, therefore, she's she's probably evil and wants to take away abortion rights. And, and again, I just don't understand why the world has decided that the best thing anybody can be is a careerist that makes it to the top of a Forbes 500 company 
um, as the CEO and that anything stopping a woman getting there, like having kids and things, that therefore is obviously misogynistic. And so it's, it's a walk through. Like I've been very blessed in my career and I'm very lucky and by far the best thing in my life is my wife and kid. Um, and I have no intention of sacrificing that to get to the top, but the world seems to have decided that unless, unless you can act like a man and have um, no kids or kill your kids if you want to in order to get to the top, uh, then that's the pinnacle. And it's just this dreadful, so we're talking here about there being a light in the darkness and moving towards the light. And if that's the light that people want to move towards their career, I can tell you from experience, it's really unsatisfying sacrificing things to try and move ahead in a career. But that's where we're at in the sexual revolution. So I want to talk about why the darkness is getting darker. darker. And there's this um, scripture in Romans which really sums up the fact that um, when you see these things, it's because God's withdrawing his hand um, and essentially handing us over to his wrath. So, uh, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, but God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. I think if I was to try and write a sentence anywhere near as good as this about what's happening right now, it would come down to that, especially the last part. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. The reason I'm even talking about any of this is because it's getting so confusing and scary to even know what you can and can't say publicly nowadays because we're in a position where this stuff is being so forced upon us that there's this new dogma of this new religion that's spouted out that nobody can talk about, but they claim that they're all pros in it. And, and that if you go against um, any of their theories about trans uh, people or have LGBT rights um, or um, e even some of the race things that are coming out now, you have to tiptoe around it. Um, again, I'm very pro, um, people can do what they want, but we have to call it what it is. And when you see it here in the Bible, what Paul is saying is when you start to see these things, it's a sign that God is, is withdrawing his hand and he's handing us over to to our lusts. In the next um, couple of scriptures, he talks about how men forsake men and women forsake um, men, sorry, men to take women and turn to men. And so that's all the sign that, that God is, uh, is withdrawing. And if you're wondering whether or not it'll affect us, one thing I meant to say is, well, again, because I know in, in individual situations, somebody, you know, each individual is different and everybody has has a reason for going through other guns. So I'm not talking about individuals here, but I'm talking about the spirit that's coming on that's trying to force this stuff down our throats. It's actually getting quite nerve-wracking. It's where I read an article the other day by a trans rights activist that said that puberty is transphobic. Because how can a kid go through puberty um, if they don't want to, and if it makes them become the gender that they don't want to, then they're stuck in that forever. So their position was every child everywhere should be given puberty blockers until they're 18 and can choose which gender they want to be. And so. Brenda's pregnant, we're going to have a kid again in, in May, we'll have a, a new baby, we're going to find out the gender and we're looking forward to it. That would be transphobic now because you can, how can you take a scan and, and see a baby and know what gender it is. So if we put that on Facebook, we'd be guaranteed to get some backlash. And that's where, again, we're at. There's this sense coming through from the world. And so, again, I'm not going after individuals here, I'm saying that this activism that's starting to come after us and wants to cancel us, this cancel culture wants to take our jobs, it is going to get darker, and things are getting darker. Paul goes on to say, Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper. People having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Sorry, Dad. Uh, without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. And though they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do those same, but they also approve of those who practice them. Again, it's a, their last sentence really starts to sum it up, like we're in a place where people are approving so much of these things that God has clearly said uh, are evil and worthy of death, as are we all, which I'll talk about too. And I'll keep it on time. 
So we'll quickly sum this up. If we're wondering if it's going to get any better, it's not. According to King David in the Bible, in Psalm 2, he just does a list of what's, what it's going to be like in the end days in the first couple of lines of this. Why are the nations restless and the people plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. Again, a good description of what the leaders around the planet are doing right now is actively saying the old morality is, is Christian, we want to get rid of that, and we want to uh, we want to go after our own ones, so let's throw those shackles apart. It goes on then to say that, that um, God uh, will come back and, and, and overthrow that. Anyway, um, I've got four, three minutes. Dad said I might be able to have to take two, so I'll, I'll wrap this up because I want to end on a good note. Um, but it's a bit like Canadians at, at Christmas time as we were all there. Where is the light in the darkness? Because we can see that it's dark. It's getting darker, like I say. It will become a time where a sermon like this one will become illegal and really all I'm doing is talking about um, the fact that this stuff's out there and what the Bible says about it. And we want to be really clear um, that, that sin is sin and all of us we were dead to sin. Um, Christ made us alive. And so the idea really is that in the darkness we want to focus on, on the light. Paul said as much, but you brothers are not in the dark, uh, for this day to overtake you like a thief. And he's talking about the end times here. Um, we know what's going to come, and that's what I was going to talk about. Um, so I'll quickly touch on that. That God's plan really is, is to free us from sin. There's three parts of God's plan that I want to mention here today, because it is the light, and it is what we want to focus on. The first one is, you were dead in your offenses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the year of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So the point here that Paul's making, which I think is a great one, is that sinning isn't something that we just did. It's something that we all essentially were. It was a big part of who we are, and we were working that out. So it's quite incredible to think that God, in his mercy, freed us from that and made us alive again in him. He managed to free us from, from sin and death and made us alive with him. And I've been thinking a lot about this. There's this phenomenal one by A.W. Tozer where he's talking about the attributes of God. And it's really easy to start thinking about God is being merciful because he saved us, but he's also, how can he have justice on, on people? And so he must suspend his justice so that he can show us mercy. But Tozer said, um, God never suspends one attribute in order to exercise another. All of God does, all that God does. So it's this phenomenal thing where God looked at us, dead in our sin, knew that the wages of that was, was death. We deserved, because we're so far away from where God wanted us to be, and we were all acting acting it out, like we're acting out what Paul described there in Romans, um, that, that God knew on the one hand the wages of that is death, and on the other hand that he loved us and wants to free us from it. So it's this phenomenal picture that if a human died in their sin, that's essentially what we deserve, um, but only a human can pay the price for this sin because it's humans that are acting that way. And so what did God do? He became a human in order to come down and pay the price. A sinless human died on behalf of all of us. It's this phenomenal picture that then frees us from sin, and that's the light that we want to look towards. It's not the end of the story, however. Next, he's coming to restore all things. So this is from Acts. That he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouths of his holy prophets from ancient times. And so this is an Acts after Jesus has died and rose again. Paul, um, this is Peter speaking, saying that, um, heaven holds Jesus until he comes back and restores all things. And so this is something I'm preaching really to myself here that I need to remind myself of a lot. The point of living isn't just to make it to heaven. We're not just here to do enough to try and get to heaven. The point and the plan for God, this whole plan for history, is really to come back and restore all things. And so if you don't know about the end times, it's something I've been studying a lot lately, and it's, it's amazing how there's 150 chapters in scripture on the end times and it's something that we tend to look at and go that's too difficult you know i did for a long time it's too difficult how do we understand it but it's this phenomenal picture of that things are going to get dark and then there's going to come a man of apostasy who's going to set himself up in jerusalem and uh and call himself god 
Uh, it, that's three and a half years he'll persecute the church, but in that time it'll be the church's greatest hour. We'll see amazing miracles like the ones we just heard about. Um, but we will be persecuted for three and a half years, and then things will suddenly get better, and there'll be a thousand years of Jesus' reign, and then God comes. So I could talk about that probably for weeks on that one, but it's this phenomenal picture that darkness is getting darker, it's going to get really dark, and then suddenly things will get a lot better, and it will be a lot better for us if he came back, which is what he wants to do. And so when we talk about what's God's heart for 2021, I would say God's heart for all time has been to restore all things and come back for a spotless bride. So he's made it it possible for us to be free from sin. He's coming back to restore all things. And when he comes back, this is what the church says, let us rejoice and be glad in him and give glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So Nick was talking about this morning um, outside about the bride and how we are the bride. And so it's a very true picture that that is what we're supposed to be, dead to sin, clothing ourselves in fine acts and praying for him to come because he will restore all things and it will be a lot better if he's here. And that's why the spirit and the bride say come and anybody who hears should say come because we know that it'll be better when he returns. And so I think I'll end there because I'm only two minutes over miracle of miracles. Um, and I'll just say that because I think that's really what I wanted to say for today is that as a church, and and when I say as a church, I mean globally, I I believe we need to be focusing on what's God's plan, because it's clearly laid out what's happening as the darkness gets darker, what what is it that we should be focusing on and going after, and it is it is Jesus, it is what he did for us, it is his plan for the future, and it's an incredible thing. So Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have a plan and that even in that darkness you are a bright burning light and you see your church as such. And we thank you that you're calling us to yourself and that you've shared your plan with us, Father, that we can know who you are. We know what you're doing in this time. And so we just pray, Lord, that even though the darkness gets darker, that this will be the time where there will be the greatest revival in history, where more people than ever will turn to you. And so we just pray that you would come, that you would reveal yourself to your bride and that you would prepare us for your turn.